Good afternoon and welcome to Your Town. We appreciate your joining us today. I'm Thomas Hood, your host, and I'm here with a wide range of talent and experience with some very interesting people on the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, and our first up here, I'd like to introduce you to Tracy Velo, fine art photographer. Hi, welcome. Tom. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. How are you? I'm good. Good. Great. Amongst other things, besides uh, helping me out of uh, operator error computer <laughs> problems <laughs> yeah. and learning a little bit about your art when you were doing an exhibition at Trent Museum, I'm glad you could come over today. And uh, uh, I want to learn more about the difference between photography and fine art photography. And I figured you'd be the perfect person to ask. No. Tell me about that. Well, I can do that. Um, I, had a, I had a friend who refused to call himself a fine art photographer because it's, he said, sounds too highfalutin. Sounds like I'm full of myself. And there's a, 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 we commonly use the phrase fine art to mean high quality. That's not what fine art photography is. It's a type of photography, like wedding photography, or commercial photography, or product photography, or whatever you want. Uh, it's a type of photography, and the type it is, is photos taken with the intent of being displayed on a wall as art. It's that simple. Right. And, it, and they're just like there's good wedding photography and horrible wedding photography, there's good fine art photography, and there's really terrible fine art photography. So, <laughs> Where do you fit in those? You've been uh, doing this you, since you, you were you, 10? You, you, right? can't, you can't ask me where I fit. <laughs> that, that's a judgment made by other people. All right, but as I understand, you're down in San Diego at age 10. Mm -hmm. You build your own darkroom. I did. What was the inspiration? Uh, necessity. Uh, I went to Disneyland with my parents, obviously, at that age. And I bought a little itty bitty tin camera the, in a little cellophane bag, you know, that was right. about that big, literally, because I wanted to take pictures. like a Minox only. Y yeah, except made a tin. yeah, it made a tin. It was yeah. about fifty cents or something. And I took a bunch of pictures, and I thought, oh great, I'm going to memorialize my trip. And so I took them to the drugstore, and the guy looked at it and said, Are you kidding? So I'm not going to process that film because the film was that big. <laughs> so I went on a hunt. I couldn't find anybody, anybody in the United States. So I went to mail to New York, all that other sort of stuff, and finally realized that if I wanted to see the pictures I took, I was going to have to develop the film myself. Nobody would develop your first work. No, nope. no. Nope. So I. That's like a, I went a, into that's the like laundry a painter room. trying to sell his first piece. Yeah, probably. I went into the laundry room and sealed it all up and. Started choking on fumes and did that for decades. And you were hooked. <laughs> I was hooked. <laughs> well, was there one particular artist that really sparked your eye? We were talking earlier about early 20th century work in the United States and Europe. What, who was your there, inspiration? At some, I was raised in an artistic family. My mother was a painter and my father was a writer. And, and, um, and photography for me was like it is for most people. It was just a way of recording memories. Um, until one day I saw a photograph by Otto Steinart called, variously called the pedestrian's foot and it's very abstract. It's a circle and a line and a tree and kind of a blurry foot walking. Fairly famous photograph but mm -hmm. I, I was just immediately hit by the fact that oh my god photography can be an art form because this thing was just and this, you're, beautiful. you're 15 years old at that point or something? Uh, about 15, as a matter of fact. Right. I believe that's right. All right. Well, we mentioned earlier we were talking about photographers. And, um, I'm, I'm photographer, not fine art. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I trained in my dad's Leica, but my inspiration didn't go into photography, went into architecture, but it was uh, Carter Brasson's shot of the bicycle going by at the end of the passage, and yep. that I think was yep. shot in Paris. Good choice of photographer. And it, sh it just stuck in my mind. Yep. So yep. when you mentioned uh, Steinert, I could, I could understand the connection. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're, you're photographing, you started doing computer program in 78, which is, that's like in the, the Bronze Age. Yeah, <laughs> approximately. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to earn a living. Fortran? Uh, no, no, huh? I started with assembly language. Uh, which a lot of people don't even know what that is these days, and then uh, moved from assembly language to Pascal to C to C plus plus, and after thirty years, I threw well, my hands up. But this led to some pretty amazing clients: Apple, Disney, Sony, National Geographic, McGraw Hill, PBS. Yeah, and they weren't. You all obviously grabbed onto this emerging technology and really well, ran they, with it. and those weren't all. Um, all programming clients. Uh, National Geographic uh, was um, artistic work. I created a multimedia uh, program for them. Mm -hmm. um, Disney, 
Uh, if you ever saw The Little Mermaid, the titles of The Little Mermaid, where she swims in and it says The Little Mermaid, right. they kind of wiggle in the water like that. I did the wiggling. So, well, that's there's, odd, there's more of your artwork. Of it's not hanging, hanging on a wall. It's on everyone's yeah, it's right. it's TV on DVDs. Set. <laughs> <laughs> and then you started teaching after this. So going from 10 years old to then doing computer programming, you've got these big clients. Now you take yourself back into an academic environment. What did you instill in your students for, by that time? What, what was happening? Well, the student class that I had were, they were all beginners, but they were fortunately adults. It was a, a grad, grad student class. And they would bring their own equipment? Or they you brought provide? their own equipment. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to give them um, an idea of how, uh, how you make art out of photography. And so it, it was a matter of form and composition and how to train your eye uh, to not include the extraneous stuff and include only what you need to make the statement. Um, and uh, I, I'm pleased to say that I could see some progress in the students over the course of uh, you know a half a year. Um, so you, so you they, weren't teaching mechanics. They had to no, know it, the you know, equipment. For, you were teaching composition. Yeah, I, uh, the first course, I think, we talked about f-stops and aperture. But after that, it was fun. it's fundamentally composition. Well, I understand that you've been on many, many juries, uh, juries, and you've sought out. When you go from teaching to judging other work, what are you looking for? Pretty much what I taught. I'm looking for form and composition, and um, and something that surprises me. Uh, something that is uh, unique. I I just uh, I just judged a category of photographs for the uh, Cal Expo. Uh, up in, in Sacramento. I didn't go there. They sent me the images. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, the, the photograph that actually won the expo turned out to be in my batch of photographs. And it was a, a combination of a hillside a, a shooting across a valley with fog rolling in it. But right smack in the middle of the picture was the undercarriage of a very modern bridge that just went up and out the corners. And the contrast between nature and this architectural masterpiece um, was so stark and so, um, I don't know, just fascinating, unexpected. In unexpected. those pieces that you were evaluating, different subjects, landscapes, abstracts, people? No, actually, it was uh, landscape, my categories were landscapes and uh, life in California. So that, a lot of people in the latter. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, right. So, with all the uh, permanent collections you're in, you've got you've got works in Crocker, the Triton, uh, the Montage Foundation. Mm -hmm. As they've taken your pieces, have they pulled from a wide range of your portfolio, your completed work, or yes, are they I'm, looking for particular? No, things? I'm very happy to say that. Uh, I'm not the guy who photographs mailboxes. <laughs> you know, so my work is my work is so varied that it annoys a lot of people. But it seems that museum curators like that. Well, let's take like a look at some the of these. Uh, let's bring up the uh, first photograph. I don't know if these are chronological, but uh, I didn't realize you were doing black and white work. Oh, this is uh, in Marina at uh, oh, something Padden Park. Uh, my wife. Is says, this Elkhorn Slough? Uh, no, no. Uh, Lake Patton, over by the library in Marina. Oh, okay. All right. And um, when we first moved out there, uh, I, I drove past there and I said to myself, someday I'm going to come out here and I'm going to take a picture of a heron. <laughs> you know, just eight years later, my wife said, it's, it's 530, get up, you know, go out there to the, go out there to the lake. Take some pictures. Okay, fine. There you go. So I went out, um, and that's all the way across the lake. That was taken with a telephoto lens. And when I got out there, the heron perched on there was not there. And I took some pictures to the left and some pictures to the right. And when I swung back, there was the heron that I imagined would always be there. He just magically appeared. So I grabbed the shot, and I grabbed a few more and a few more. And I thought, okay, I've got enough. And I turned away took a couple of more shots to the left, turned back, and he was gone. Were you shooting film? No, this is all digital. Okay. I, I left film about 14 years ago. So this not only was a, a moment for composition, but a, but time. Uh, it was, Ten minutes it later, was, it, it would have been a different shot. It was time and serendipity and uh, a little bit of magic. <laughs> 
But so let's keep these going. This, this is sure. This is fine. fascinating to hear from you on these. So what's next? Oh, there is a famous Chinese uh, photograph called the Six Persimmons by Fu Si. Very, very famous. Mm -hmm. um, and this is my um, homage to Fu Si's uh, persimmon picture. The, it's laid out almost identical, close as I could come, and the tonalities and sizes are about the same as his, uh, his persimmons. Um, I, I think it's one, his persimmon work, not this, is one of the most fabulous and elegant um, Sumier uh, paintings, done very, very quickly, and, and it's um, extraordinary. Architects do the same thing, homage to a particular yep. date or architect, and you can, you can feel, you can see that influence right there. Yeah. What else have we got here? Let's take another look at another one. Ah, I call this one vintage. Um, it's uh, a, an old Carpenter Gothic um, that was, I believe, moved to that location. It's on I've River Road. I've seen that building, yes. Yeah. It's on River Road, and I believe the uh, the intent was probably that the winery was going to um, fix it up and, and and use it as a tasting room or a visitor center or something or other like that. But uh, when I got out there, the uh, the vines were um, in between. I don't know what that's uh, dormant, mm -hmm. and uh, and so was the house. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like it's actually floating on top of the, uh, yeah, the it's Dharma Vines right there. It, yeah. Love it. Let's see the next one here. Ah, this one appeared uh, in Outdoor Photographer magazine. Um, I, I did not solicit them. They called me. They had run across it on my website and said, oh, we love it. Can we use it? And I said, sure. Where was this? This is Yosemite. Okay. Uh, up up above the valley mm -hmm. uh, and on Tioga Road somewhere, or just off Tioga Road somewhere. It's refreshing it, to see a shot of Yosemite that doesn't include the falls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, or Half Dome. That, uh, that cloud, it, there was a, a, a breeze, a calm wind, whatever you'd call it, but it was, it was moving along pretty quick. So here's the element of time again. Uh, element of time. And I actually had to run. My wife pointed it out to me and I had to run to get ahead of it and threw myself down on the ground and hit it just as it was in the right position. And you know, half a second later it was over the tree and two Completely seconds later different it was gone. mindset uh, and approach than, uh, than your onions. Yes, right. Okay, let's keep these going. These are great. Yeah. I like this. Now, I like there's, this a lot. The, the images that you've, you've seen are, uh, so far are pretty images, mm -hmm. but there's, uh, particularly in more, in more um, uh, modern um, art, there's a need to tell a story. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean that fine art can't tell a story, but fine art appeals to the emotions more than it does to some kind of cerebral process. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this image, which I call Exit, um, I find you know, storytelling is slightly ironic there uh, from within the confines of all this concrete and gray and tile and, and so on is this great huge window which doesn't do anything but look out onto a great huge white wall. There's no vanishing point that's perceptible. You've got this renaissance inspired one point perspective that doesn't go anywhere. Right. right. <laughs> and there the only color to speak of in it is that blue stripe of real freedom. Mm -hmm. And I, I call it exit based on the sign because it's fairly obvious that if you wanted to go out and get to that freedom, you would go out that door, but unfortunately, you'd be greeted with a white wall. And you're going, per you're going yeah, parallel so to the vanishing yeah. point. So that, uh, that's, it's actually the Marina Post Office. <laughs> okay. Let's see what else we've got. Ah. Okay, here's a comment. I'll get in trouble from some people. This is my, um, my comment on um, spirituality in the modern world. The name of this image is God Talks to Me. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another moment in time, though. Yes. Sunrise. No, actually sunset. The cloud. Sunset. Sunset. The cloud. Mm -hmm. And the only permanent thing in the picture is the old uh, set of... Uh, the old TV antenna on top yeah. of that. All right, let's see what else we've got. All right. Oh, I like this. This is an award-winning uh, photograph. It's in San Francisco, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a it's a it's a good example of what constitutes fine art, um, reasonably good fine art uh, by somebody's definition because it's won a few awards. Um, when I when I saw the image, it was really the Transamerica building in the back that first caught my eye, and I all I could think of was Godzilla. <laughs> He's kind of creeping up this triangular thing amidst all this other stuff. Hasn't happened but yet. But if you if you um, if you look at that image, we the the buildings you can almost anthropomorphize. There's a, a little old lady, and then there's a, a something left over from the 70s, and mm -hmm. then there's a, a pseudo Art Deco, um, and the combination of vertical lines and then the horizontal or the angular line of the rooftop is uh, is what got me. And it's actually named. I don't know if we can see it. Yeah, actually, almost in the middle of the image is a little teeny white um, area. Mm -hmm. with, a, with a flower box in it, and that's the name of the image, flower box. Wonderful. Okay. And this one I call Flight. Uh, I took it at the Concours, um, and it was, for a number of years, the image on my uh, business card. Uh, I've since changed. I recall that. I mean, it, it has that emblem on the, on the car has such a fluid quality at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like you've done this, this with acrylic. Yeah, you know, that's I'm wonderful. Sure. Yeah, that that's was great. that was a sort of like a found image. The the actual photograph was a little larger than that, and then I realized, ooh, if I crop this, I might have something. <laughs> Let's see a couple more here with the minute we have left here. Uh huh. This is Birth of the Universe. Uh, people, this is also in um, in one of the museums, and it's um, people ask what it is, and I refuse to tell them. I've got an idea. Was this taken the same day you took the previous shot? No. So that's not the uh, rear it, window on a convertible. No, no, it's taken not. from the back. Yeah, it's seat. a good guess, but no. All right, I thought I'd give it a shot. Uh, it's it just <laughs> struck me as, as as the birth of the universe, well, and it, mm -hmm. it's we've gone from fairly traditional photography now, and we're we're in the last couple moving into kind of abstract and more conceptual mm -hmm. uh, kind of types. Well, not conceptual, but abstract. This last piece, and then you've got an exhibition piece we'll show up next. This is called Yang, uh, and the thing that's interesting about it is, um, it, first of all, it's a very large piece. It's 40 inches wide and 60 inches high. And the three um, black horizontal lines that you see there um, are a massive blow up of uh, three fountain pen ink on watercolor paper that are, in reality, um, about half an inch long, a little less than half an inch long. We're out of time. We've got to go through more of these. Well, are we done? Okay. We're done. All Thank right. Thank you so much. You've been watching Your Town. That was perfect. You bet. Thanks, Tom. That's good.